Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the great outdoors and the importance of protecting our state parks and recreational spaces with special guests. Rachel Norton, Executive Director of the California State Parks Foundation. Bonnie Hawley, Executive Director of the Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks. And Marcy Mowry, President of the Pennsylvania Parks and Forests Foundation. So thank you all for joining us. Wild open and recreational spaces offer so much, right? Respite, room for learning, health benefits for people. There's habitat for animals and plants. Uh, We preserve ecosystems. We help to uh, restore our watersheds, our air. Um, And in return, we haven't been caring for these spaces as we should have. We see these spaces basically diminish year after year. We see, for example, the Colorado River, uh, not being cared for and the, those water levers um, uh, dropping and, and the people who depend on that with that water now um, don't have enough of it. Uh, these are all huge challenges and you have specific challenges in each of your areas. So let's begin in California from a macro level and then go to the individual parks. Um, so Rachel, could you give us a, a, a view of your from your seat, the state of California parks today, um, as opposed to the state of California parks, let's say a generation ago, 20 years ago, and two generations ago, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. It's a great, it's great to be here with all of you. And um, I love talking about parks. So (laughs) my favorite way to start the day. Um, So I would say, you know, California has an exceptional state park system. There are 279 places, many of them, you know, places that people from all over the United States love and and come to visit. I mean, we have a number of ring of parks around Lake Tahoe. We have so many wonderful desert parks, so many the redwoods and far northern California, the beaches. You can see behind Bonnie, one of our beautiful Santa Cruz beaches. Um, So these are really, I like to say, you know, the jewel in the crown for all of um, America's state parks. What's great is that parks are having a moment since COVID. Really, you know, in the early days when we were all locked down, um, parks were the only places that people could go and feel safe. Um, And uh, we saw just a huge uptick in people visiting parks during that time. And that has continued even as the virus has waned somewhat. Um, and Those so, natural spaces are economic drivers. Let's oh, make absolutely. no mistake. And we're going to go to, to Marcy talking about Pennsylvania, but those are economic drivers for certain regions, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Huge, you know, uh, tourism dollars, um, economic boost, like your, uh, you know, your property values go up if you're near a park. There's so many economic drivers around parks. They're a huge economic boon to communities. Um, so, so that's a wonderful thing. But at the same time, we're dealing with climate change and all of the impacts that California generally is facing in climate change, you know, our extreme drought, extreme heat, wildfires, biodiversity loss, like all of those things are also happening in state parks. And what I would say is that, um, there is more sophistication about the need to maintain these places and really conserve these places and provide access to these places. And at the same time, um, we still have a huge gap in between between what is needed to actually maintain these places at a standard that I think you and I would find basic. Um, so, you know, we have a $1.2 billion deferred maintenance backlog in California state parks. Marcy mentioned, I know <laughs> Pennsylvania has a similar problem. As far as I know, every park system across the country has that problem. We have this idea that parks um, can somehow just happen or be there for us without us having that they're free and they're not free. I mean, we want them to be free for people to visit, but um, but we have to care for them and that costs money. And so advocacy is a big part of our work in California State Park. So Marcy, are you are you finding that you also what kind of a backlog do you have um, since uh, Rachel mentioned uh, um, that that issue and has it over the years, has that backlog accumulated or has it been reduced over the last uh, 20 years? 
Well, we, we do have a backlog, backlog. In Pennsylvania, our foundation works with our, both our state parks. And we now have 124 in our state forests. We have 2.4 million acres of that. And in 2019, we, we released a report that identified a billion dollar need for maintenance and infrastructure projects. A billion dollars. Yeah, well, in 2020, 2021, we looked at it again and it was up to $1.4 billion. Because as you defer maintenance, much like your home, if you don't put on a new roof, you may end up replacing your furniture, your ceiling, the floors. So as we defer maintenance, it becomes more costly because things continue to deteriorate. Um, it also has become more costly because supplies have become more costly and access to the people that can do that work has become more costly. So it continues to grow. We were fortunate this year in Pennsylvania to have $75 million of the American Rescue Plan allocated towards those projects. But some of these projects are large scale. You don't think about the hidden infrastructure in state parks and state forests, the dams that create the lakes that you enjoy, the water and sewage treatment facilities, you don't realize they're there until the sewage treatment facility is no longer working and you can't use the restroom facilities. And then there's the natural infrastructure. We've had spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania, the hemlock woolly adelgid, the emerald ash borer that's taking out a lot of our tree canopies. So these are, these are uh, invasive species that have come in and can basically wreck a, wreck a whole ecosystem. You can actually see trees you can go to you can be walking along a trail come to a place and you can just see a whole set of of um, trees just in in not only distress but basically uh, on the way to gone gone Help, hemlock woolly adelgid has decimated our, our hemlock trees which are often along waterways and keep water at a cooler temperature um Emerald ash borer, we've lost 99% of our ash trees. And once they become infected, they become very brittle and they become hazardous trees. So they're costly to remove. And then you have to replant them. Pennsylvania provides the majority of the fresh water to the Chesapeake Bay. And if we're going to meet our guidelines of keeping the bay clean, we have to keep our, our waterways, our riparian areas fully planted. And parks and forests play a key role in that. And, and, you know, if we, if we move over to Bonnie, uh, Bonnie and I were talking about the fires that have actually hit, right? That's part of maintenance as well, fire suppression or uh, proactive burning so that you don't have the buildup of fuels. Uh, Bonnie, are you, uh, are you suffering also from deferred maintenance or has the, have the catastrophes that have hit some of the state parks uh, resulted in funding that allows you to address some of this? Right. Well, parks have a lot of missions. They have a lot they have to accomplish. They mean a lot to so many people. And clearly the CZU fire that hit Big Basin two years ago was a catastrophe. 97% of that oldest state park in California burned over. But we're taking it as an opportunity to really go with the public through a process back to the drawing board and to reimagine Big Basin in a way that in the future will be more accessible, will better protect the old growth redwoods and will be climate resilient in the long run. So it's really an opportunity for the community to come together and look to the future in a new way. You know, as a proud obsessive compulsive uh, wonk, I've, I've actually gone back and read books and accounts of how uh, Americans have viewed their wild spaces over the last 150 years, uh, going back to the mid 1800s. Um, I guess it's more than 150 years now. And, and you see this, this transformation. Initially, you see kind of wild spaces being taken for granted and it's kind of this, this idea of limitlessness and, and sort of uh, people's responsibility to develop any land that's available. Eventually, there comes a consciousness that maybe this, these are limited resources, but the idea was that they were self-healing. In other words, just, just leave them alone, you know, give it a little bit of time to rest and you're fine. And nowadays we're, we're discovering that there's more intervention. Bonnie, could you talk a little bit about in your career arc, have you seen a change in attitudes and a change of, of how your organization has functioned uh, in terms of, of how people in Santa Cruz are seeing this amazing resource that is tied to your economic vitality uh, in that part of the country? 
Well, in our organization, uh, which is Santa Cruz County and coastal San Mateo County, we support 34 parks and beaches uh, from the Redwoods and, and including um, a lot of historic buildings from the Mission period, from the Victorian period. And we also really celebrate the stewards of these lands who go back thousands of years. So there's really a lot here that there is to protect. But I think one thing that we do really well in California is our parks department at the state level takes partnerships very seriously. It's not just lip service. And as a park partner, we are literally co-managers. We're embedded, we provide services and we bring the love from the community to the table. We bring resources to the table. We're innovators uh, and we really drive a lot of new programs and projects uh, in consultation with parks and with the community. So I think California uh, nonprofits with state parks are a real success story. I think that's so absolutely continue, true. Continue, Bonnie, and I'd like Rachel, if, if you could weigh in, I just I, I just have yeah. a question because uh, Bonnie just raised a, an issue of respect for the technical expertise of native peoples in caring for the land. Uh, for thousands and thousands of years. There's a technical knowledge, right? There's an expertise. Are we all discovering that that disrespect that people have shown for that expertise is really harming us? And we have to find respect. We have to engage people with this expertise that perhaps our attitudes have prevented us from exercising. Oh, definitely. I, I mean, I think we are we're undergoing a reckoning in California about our treatment of indigenous people and our sort of erasure of those um, of that knowledge that was actually that is very important. And the, at the state level, there is a whole effort going on now to really tap into indigenous wisdom around controlled burns, for example, and landscape stewardship and um, the state. Preservation of native species, right? Mm -hmm. The state is signing agreements with tribes about um, their ancestral lands and helping um, uh, care for those lands, even when they're technically, you know, state-owned parklands now, um, because many of those lands are, were stolen. You know, they were they were um, occupied for thousands of years by indigenous people, and then you know when settlers from the east, European settlers, came, they stole the lands and you know began to farm them and care for them in the way that they thought was the right way. And now we know better, so we have to do better. And uh, in Pennsylvania, Marcy, we, we have the, we have a similar uh, issue, but it's 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 way older because Native peoples were pushed out earlier, and they were frequently pushed west, right? And and what we ended up with was during the industrial uh, age in, in the United States, we had trees that were basically clear cut, harvested for coking coal uh, for the steel plants, right? And and that. It took a took a huge swath out of Pennsylvania, out of Ohio, out of New York, and so on. Um, how are you looking at preservation in historic terms and it, the engagement of uh, of all these different interests, including Native interests, but not exclusively, so that you're engaging people in your work? How do you do that? How do you get people engaged? We well, we get people engaged through conversation. I mean, you, you touched on it. And by the late 1800s, 90 percent of Pennsylvania's forests had been decimated. Right. And, you know, it, it caused wildfires, massive flooding. And it, it was the wake up call for people to realize that, you know, the environment is important and we have a role in stewarding it. Erosion, landslides. Right. I mean, there was there, there was real catastrophe. The Johnstown flood, it's, it's, a, it's a national park looking at the impact of this massive flood that took over 1,200 lives. So, you know, and a lot of our, our we, you know, not only lumbering, but we had coal mining, we had um, other industrial uses of the land, you know, gas was, oil was first discovered in, in Pennsylvania. So all of those industrial uses of the land left a mark. And part of our infrastructure needs are to try to restore the, our waterways from abandoned mine drainage to plug abandoned wells. So, yes, yeah, we're looking, too, at, at indigenous wisdom, um, but we're also trying to tell the stories of the landscape from all the different users. Pennsylvania was key in the Underground Railroad. Um, you know, what roles did we play in that and what, how did the landscape interact with, with um, 
freedom seekers. You know, originally, Pennsylvania was the place where you were free, but then you know, when the laws changed, you, they had to go to Canada. So it became a, a pass through area. So we're trying to have conversations. We're trying to bring in uh, diverse viewpoints on how do we manage our lands? How do we reinvigorate um, them? How do we make them more climate resilient? Because we're seeing, we, we had one forest district that had 2,000 year floods back to back. You know, our system, you, you can't handle that. So how do we, how do we make our, our systems more resilient? How do we plant more trees? You know, tree is like the cure all. How do we plant more trees to, to try to be carbon sinks? How do we preserve those places in the landscape that can help everybody by making the state more climate resilient? Are, is what you're all saying is that the separation between um, these preserved reg regions and the inhabited ones, that separation actually, that, there is no real separation in that, in that sense. In other words, what happens in one place is going to migrate someplace else. It's going to affect someplace else. If you're far, a farmer, you care about the habitat that a forest provides to bees who pollinate and the protection that, they, that it provides to insects that are useful. So this, this idea of, of this is mine and that's something else and I'm not interested in that, is, have we gotten beyond that where, where we really need to engage everybody? We need to engage the inner city kid who has never been to a state park. We have to somehow get them to a state park and get them exposed and see their own interest in the Absolutely. I think we need to help people to make those connections to see how they're connected. You know, we can do that by getting people out. But what we just did, we just created a video that looked at trees. Trees, trees roll in protecting water quality, clean water's role in the craft beverage industry. So now we're, we're talking to beer drinkers and they're saying, oh, I didn't realize that there was such a connection. Well, you're drinking a liquid, but you know, if that's where we can reach you in the conversation to help you to understand how important these places in the landscape are, then let's have that conversation from where we can meet you on your, on your, at your level, where, you, where your entry level is to talking about conservation. Right. Bonnie, you've got you've got a big uh, a big history uh, there in your area where the fisheries absolutely collapsed because we weren't taking care of our, our, our coastal areas. Where uh, wasn't that wasn't that a big uh, impact? Yeah, in that, area? that is true. And now we have a series of underwater parks in California, marine protected areas that are you know, part of the state park system. And I think, you know, your question about engaging um, youth, especially, um, I think. I'm pretty sure everybody, if they think about it for a minute, could conjure up a memory of a field trip that they went on as a kid. And those field trips are really important. Uh, we have a park equity field trip program here in our area called Kids to Parks. And we bring students from Title I schools to our state parks. Uh, we're gonna be serving 4,700 students this year. And that started as a pilot just five years ago. And one of the things that I love that the state park interpreters do at the beginning of a field trip is they say to the kids, who does this park belong to? And usually kids raise their hand and say, the governor or you. And then they turn it around and say, no, these parks belong to you. And that really starts a conversation and an ethic for future. Um, and, but that has to go beyond just that one day trip. Yeah. Uh, it's Saturday, we're having Welcome Back Monarchs Day and Natural Bridges State Beach, which uh, Natural Bridges is a monarch preserve and the monarchs have really crashed. Uh, there were 120,000 at the park in 1997 and in 2020, there are only 550. So it's an opportunity to talk about that crisis, but also what can you do at home? Can you plant pollinator friendly uh, flowers in your yard? Can you support pollinator highways in your neighborhood? And bringing that message beyond the park into our backyards is a really important message. Can I just jump into and say, you know, Marcy brought up a really important point about stories because every park has um, layers of stories, interconnected stories. And I think for a long time in park management, we had this idea that like there was one story, like the history of this park or, you know, the natural benefits of this park. And I think what we're trying to do now is bring in all those different layers. So that indigenous wisdom, you know, history from different perspectives. And that can be kind of painful and 
awkward at times to to kind of navigate because we all have our cherished you know memories or stories that, about a particular place but i think relevance is is key here because if we want those future generations to be as connected to these places as we are then they have to visit right but they have to feel they have to see themselves somehow in in these places and so those stories are really really important in doing that yeah i, I think that's key I was going to say that, that, that's, very, that's key, Rachel, in terms of you, people have to see themselves in the landscape. And if we're not telling their stories, that that creates an unwelcoming environment. Yes. I have a question for you all on that account. You know, in in a lot of traditions, you have um, the the pilgrimage, which everybody in that uh, particular group um, should is called upon to make. Right. If you're if you're Muslim, the the uh, pilgrimage is to Mecca. Everybody should do the Hajj one time in their lives. Uh, Jews go to Israel. Right. If you if you take a look at at um, other place other places, right? The Washington D.C. trip is is a fixture in a lot of Americans' lives. Going to Washington, seeing the nation's capital visiting the Lincoln Memorial and visiting uh, the halls of Congress. Um, should we look at a visit to parks as being the thing that all Americans should at least be able to, uh, to experience once in their lives? And should is that part of being an American? Uh, it's, it's a real question. It used to be just sort of taken for granted. But as we become more and more civilized, as population increases and there are urban centers and so on, which are divorced from parks, um, should we be considering that? Uh, Marcy, you want to you want to weigh in? And, uh, yeah. Bobby, Rachel? yeah. Yeah. And it's an interesting question. I mean, across the nation, there are over 6,500 state parks. And I, I worked in, in the Chamber of Commerce for several years and I work a lot with Chambers of Commerce. And it used to be that. You kind of mentioned, oh, yeah, when you're recruiting businesses to come in, that we have access to the parks. They now have to do that because people are recognizing that access to the outdoors is an important feature of their quality of life. It's a per an important way for them to maintain their physical, mental and emotional health. Um, and so now that, you know, chambers are utilizing and, and you know, California, Pennsylvania, all over. Hey, we have we have access to the outdoors. And I would say, yes, you know, having that pilgrimage, being able to introduce everybody to their state parks, to their community parks, if they can't get to a state park, because, you know, there's a continuum of parks. You can probably get to your community park a little easier. And, and you know, maybe that's your daily thing. But on the weekends, you get out to your state park or, or to your state forest. And maybe that advances to you doing backcountry trips. So there's a continuum of people's experience in the outdoors. But we need to be able to introduce them to these places so they feel comfortable. Because if you've never been to a state park, if you live in the inner city and you come out to a state park or you come to a state forest, that might feel uncomfortable to you. So how do we remove those barriers so you can have those pilgrimages, you can have those connections? We uh, do have, you know, we have a national program that now is being mimicked in California, you know, the Every Kid Outdoors program. Yes. So every fourth grader can get a free yeah. pass for themselves and their families to national parks, right? Any national park in the system for that year. And so in California, we fought for, with the help of Jennifer Siebel Newsom, the governor's uh, partner, um, we... Uh, fought for these passes. So there's now a California Adventure Pass that gets fourth graders and their families free admission to uh, 19 different state parks. We're going to fight to try to expand that in future years. But like, that's exactly, you know, it shouldn't be, this is your civic duty to go to parks, but it, there's so many benefits to regular visits and spending time in the outdoors that anything we can do to make it easier for people who wouldn't otherwise think of going, I think we have an obligation to do. Yeah. We did a and in Pennsylvania, it's true. We did a back for an organization called Ten Strands, which in California, it's Will Parish, Karen Cow, and so on and so forth. Um, they're trying to ensure that that every uh, young person receives uh, an education in sort of the natural environs of, of California and the world. 
as part of this. Uh, Marcy, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, uh, to cut you off. I was going to say in Pennsylvania, we're one of, I think, six or seven states that have free admission. So there's no there's no admission fee. There's no parking. Oh, that's great. But 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 transportation be, can become a barrier. So we actually help to fund transportation to get students out, to have that experience, to try to encourage youth groups and senior citizens as well. We are, you know, across the lifespan, trying to encourage people to come out and spend time. And I think it's important for our youth. A, because they're healthy places to be, but they're the future decision makers. If they don't have a connection to these places in the landscape, what's going to happen 20 or 30 years down the road when decisions on funding have to be made about, you know, how do we repair them? How do we, we, we acquire new parks? You know, we need, we need the youth to, to connect to these places in the landscape. Honey, I'll give you the last word since we're coming to the end of our time. I just want to point out that if you take a look at the, uh, the um, the mix of ethnicities in the United States, um, each area has its own unique attributes. Um, mm-hmm. If you look at Pennsylvania, for example, um, uh, populations of African-American and Hispanic uh, folks tend to cluster in particular cities, in particular areas, and then there are large rural areas that are less populated. And so in uh, by by uh, people of color. And so in order to bring, and the parks are very often there. So in order to create that connection, you have that logistics uh, issue that you're talking about, uh, Marcy, whereas in uh, your neck of the woods, Bonnie, uh, the constellation of people are, uh, yes, African-American, but, but very Hispanic, which uh, at, w- with labor uh, basically uh, working in agriculture, uh, a little bit away from the coasts, and then parking fees and those kinds of things that increases the cost of access um, might be a real impediment, particularly for people at the lower income. How do you deal with with those kinds of issues of inclusion, uh, Bonnie, um, in in terms of ensuring that everybody, everybody, everybody gets to experience these parks and appreciates them? Well, Rachel mentioned relevancy, and one program uh, that we're working on locally is to create California's newest state historic park, which will be the Castro Adobe, and it um, revolves around a historic adobe built in 1849-1850, and it symbolizes and really celebrates the deep roots of Mexican culture in our area, and it is just a magnet. People come out, they take tours, they're inspired, and they get involved in the creation of this new park. So I think if you have an inspiring story that means something to people, they will come. It's a great point. Seeing the history, seeing the various peoples who have been responsible for this land and honoring them and including everyone in this future stewardship is so key to your work. Rachel Norton, Executive Director of the California State Parks Foundation, Bonnie Hawley, Executive Director of the Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks, and Marcy Mowry, President of Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundations. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Please thank your boards, your funding, your staff, your volunteers. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Have a great day. Stay safe.